1 Samuel chapter 17. The setting of this passage is interesting. Jesse is the proud father of eight sons. The three oldest boys are in the army, making it necessary for the youngest one to assume some extra work at home. David, the youngest one, is faithfully fulfilling his responsibilities, tending the sheep, taking care of whatever his father asked him to do. Not only are the three oldest boys in the army, the country's at war. And the battle isn't too terribly far from home. I don't really know how far, but it wasn't too far. And Jesse was just like the rest of we fathers, had a vital concern about his boys. Apparently he hadn't heard from them for a little while, and he wondered how they were doing. And uh, he probably had, uh, had a little battle with the decision he made, but finally he made the decision and summons his youngest son in from the hillsides where he tended the flock and gave that youngest boy quite a responsibility. Now, Delta, I'm ready when you are. He gave that youngest son quite a responsibility. He said, David, I want you to go down to the battle and I want you to check on your brothers and see how they're doing. Didn't have to ask David twice. He said, I want you to take some food, some things to eat down to them. Here's some cheese I want you to take down to the captain. And I want you to bring me back a report. I'm worried about my boys. They're in battle. I just want to hear that everything is all right. I understand that. You fathers do too. That's where the reading of the scripture begins in verse 20 of 1 Samuel chapter 17. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion of the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistine, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the man of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that is come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up, and it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and will make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, Now what shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? Let us pray. Father in heaven, speak to us by thy word this morning. 
somehow I pray that the soul that works in the vineyard of the Lord but is here today whose spirit has gone sour or flat, I pray that in their heart and life and ministry you will renew the vision of the cause. Accomplish thy purpose in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. David might have felt a bit awkward as he rode in a chauffeured carriage, leaving the home community with all of his friends looking on. But he was going on a mission. He could hardly wait to get there. I don't know how long the journey might have taken, but in due time he arrived at the battle. He got out of the carriage and went running in among the soldiers. I imagine, as any lad would do, he was looking this way and that. He didn't want to miss anything. Can you imagine a teenage boy, which such as he was, getting to go and see the army in action? And I know in his mind he thought the three bravest soldiers in that army were his brothers. Any young lad would think that of three boys, three brothers in the military. And he ran through the crowd looking this way and that until at long last he saw his brothers. He ran up to them. He may have thrown his arms around their waist, grabbed them and gave them a warm family welcome. So happy to see them, so proud of them. But he hardly had time to visit because he had arrived at a crucial time of the morning. It was just about time for the armies to go into conflict, for they had set themselves in array, army against army. In just a few moments, the sound and signal was to be given. They were to make a mad rush, one army toward the other. At some point of rendezvous, there would be sword against shield, and occasionally soared against flesh. The screaming of pain, the thud of death, the cry of battle, all was to take place in a matter of moments. And he had arrived at such a time. But just as they were about to march forward, once again, a very bothersome thing occurred. The opposing army had a strange fellow he was kind of a freak of nature. He had outgrown his expected size. They call him a giant, an enormous man. Strong arms, strong legs, broad shoulder, a mean temper. And he marched forward as he had been coached to do. And he cried out to the army of Israel, What's the matter with you? Why do you want everybody to die and fight? I have a proposal. Pick out one man. Pick out one man among you and send him over and let him fight with me. There's no point in everybody fighting and everybody risking life and limb. Send one man. And if he can whip me, I suppose he paused to laugh, a little hellish laugh. And if he can whip me, we'll be your servants, but... <laughs> But if he can't whip me, then you'll be our servants. And he defied the armies of the living God. Now this was a shock to David. David had lived, no doubt, a sheltered life. He had never heard anybody openly defy the living God. He didn't know such things happened. He was shocked beyond words. I remember the first time as just a little boy, just big enough to ride along in the back seat and rub my nose against the rear window of the car. I remember the first time when stopped in traffic and a policeman walked past our car with another man and he cursed. And I heard him curse and it frightened me. And I asked my mother, will they put him in jail? I didn't think they were supposed to curse. I didn't think those things happened. I'd lived in a home where they didn't curse. And now I heard this man curse out in public and it shocked me. 
I imagine David may have had a little of the same feeling. He had never before heard anybody openly defy the living God. And now for the first time he hears it and something rises in his heart and says something has to be done to that fellow. But he's again surprised because he notices that all the soldiers try to hide. They're afraid they might be selected to go fight him. They're afraid they might be the one that's sent forward and all the men try to stand behind the other one and get out of sight. Nobody wants to fight him. Everybody's afraid. And so David said, tell me what's going on here. And one of them said, well, I'll tell you, said the man that will kill him, he said, uh, he said the, the king will really, really do him right. Said he will bless him economically. He'll give him great riches. He'll bless him domestically. He'll give him his daughter to wife. He'll bless him politically. He'll make his family tax exempt. He said just a lot of wonderful things will happen to the man who will kill him. And David said, I find it kind of interesting. He said, now tell me again what he'll do. And so they went through the whole thing again. And they told him the second time what the king would do to the one who would kill him. But all of a sudden, Eliab, David's oldest brother, isn't, isn't too pleased with what he's hearing. He isn't happy that his kid brother has come into camp and made a stir. He isn't happy that his kid brother comes in and acts braver than he. And so he cries out to David and he said, David, what are you doing down here? Why have you come anyway? I know the naughtiness of thine heart. I know thy pride. You have just come down to see the circus. You just come down to see the battle. You just wanted to see the fight. You're just a kid. With whom have you left those few sheep you have back there? And David is so shocked. I imagine his eyes got big. He may have turned the palms of his hands upward. And he said, what have I done? What have I done? And then he asked another question. He said, say, is there not a cause? Amen. Is there not a cause? Now that was a loaded question. Because it was saying, brother, if there is not a cause, get home. Dad needs you. If there is not a cause, quit playing war games down here. If there is not a cause, let's go on home together. Is there not a cause? But if there is a cause, then let's go out there and whip that fellow. Amen. I kind of like that spirit. Praise the Lord. Is there not a cause? It was the cause that has gripped David's heart. The fact that he has heard the God of Israel being openly cursed and defied that has caused something to rise up in this little fella that says, I don't particularly care how big he is. There is a cause that's bigger than the giant. There's a cause that means more than a little risk. There's a cause that exceeds the impending danger. There is a cause that motivates us to do something about the problem at hand. Oh, that God would raise up another generation of us uh, who would somehow recognize there is a cause. There is a cause that send us into the face of danger if need be. There is a cause uh, that does not ask how much is it going to pay. There is a cause uh, that does not say, will it make me popular? But there is a cause uh, that, that will uh, cause this generation to step forward and say we must stand in our place. We must uh, oppose the enemy. We must do the will of God at any price. I want you to notice the cause and some things that it enabled David to do since he was aware and, and convicted by a cause. Number one, it helped him to overcome some things. He overcame the accusation of the family. Now Eliab had questioned David's intelligence. He had questioned his intent and he had questioned his integrity. With whom have you left those few little old sheep up there? Tried to insult him. David was kind of proud of those sheep. Uh, he kind of took a liking to them. He, everything he did, he did with all of his heart and with all of his strength. And he didn't even want to hear his sheep impugned. Sometimes I wonder about some pastors I talk to. All they want to do is impugn their flock. 
kind of bothers me a little bit. Amen. Amen. A fellow told me one time, he said, I don't understand it. He said, why is it they always give me the worst churches there are? Always give me the bad ones. I said, I haven't the slightest idea. They've always given me a good church. The facts were, some of the churches I got to, <laughs> had problems like his did. But I still thought they were good churches. And I love my flock. Amen. Don't impugn my flock. Amen. Don't even come and come in and preach to them and slice them up and cut them up and toss them out. Amen. I want to tell you something. I never expect an evangelist to come in and preach to my people something I didn't have backbone to preach to them. I'd just soon take the tough cases myself and handle it. Praise the Lord. Be careful with my flock. Don't impugn my flock. And he said, what and with whom have you left those few little sheep up there? If the easiest thing in the world for David to have done would have been, look, Eliab, I didn't mean to cause a problem. Listen, I'll run home. I'll get out of your way. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And he could have gone home and said, Dad, they're doing fine. And he could have gone out and told his buddies, I saw the battle and I saw the giant. And he could have been somewhat of a hero. But there was a cause that wouldn't let him back out that easily. There was a cause that wouldn't let him run home that quickly. There was a cause. He didn't enjoy being in conflict with his brother. Not at all. But there was a cause that meant if my family, if my family will not go along, if my family objects, if my family turns me out, if my family refuses to follow, I still, I still will stay true to the cause because it goes deeper than just my emotion. It has captured my soul. It has captured my heart. It has consumed my life. There is a cause. And if my family rejects me because of it, just so let it be, for the cause is bigger than anything else in all the world. Because he was consumed with the cause, he overcame, he overcame the evaluation of authority. I want you to notice somebody heard that, hey, David's willing to fight this giant. And somebody went running straight to the king and said, look, I believe we've got a guy. I believe we have a candidate. I believe we have somebody who will take him on. And they, he said, let me see him. And David was brought in. And immediately, the interview didn't go so well. And, and David spake to the, or rather, and then we noticed that uh, Saul said to David, when David came in before him in verse 33, Saul said to David, he said, you can't do it. Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. He said, you can't do it. And I want you to notice this isn't a Monday morning quarterback that's telling him how it ought to be done. This is the king himself. This is the, this is the commander in chief. And he's saying, you can't do it. It can't be done. It's impossible. He may have said, I appreciate your zeal and, and your youthful ambition, but I'm not going to allow it. You can't do it. It's a mismatch beyond description. I'm not going to allow it. And David could have very easily said, long live the king. Thank you very much. And he could have gone home and boasted to all of his buddies. I saw the battle, I saw my brothers, I saw the giant, and I, I volunteered to fight, and I got before the king, and I would have fought him, but the king said I couldn't, and you know, when he speaks, that's law. And so I really wanted to, and he would have been a hero in his own sorts. But, he, but there was a cause, and somehow the cause helped him to rise above the evaluation of authority. I am not suggesting insubordination. I am not suggesting that you have an independent streak in you that nobody can tell you what to do and you reject all counsel. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that the cause, the cause has to be first in our hearts. And if somebody says, well, you're called to the mission field, you say, but you can't go because you don't have all the faculties you need to go there or you don't have it all in order, respect what they say. But if God has placed a call and if God has given the burden and if God has spoken, remember the cause supersedes everything else. 
Hallelujah. I remember learning of a certain conference. Had a little church in it. That was a place and where they sent the fellows to see if they would make it or not. The fellow would go there for a year or so, and if he made it, well, he was all right, and they'd send him somewhere else, but it was a testing place because some of them didn't make it. It was a hard place, and they sent them there because it was the toughest place in the conference, and they would go down there, and some would fall by the wayside and decide they weren't called to preach after all. One of those places, you know. And at the time I'm speaking of, it was closed. They didn't have anybody to sacrifice to send them. And so it was closed. But one young man who had a local preacher's license in one of the churches called the, uh, called the official. And he said, I believe the Lord would like me to go down and start holding services in that church. And the conference president kind of chuckled. And he said, well, if you want to go, come by and I'll give you a key. He gave him a key and thought it would be the last to hear of him. But lo and behold, a month later, he got a report. Now, that's unusual within itself. <laughs> Sometimes the fellow who passes the big churches don't get around to making the report. Shame on you. But say, a month later, he got a report, and they had a few people coming to church down there. The next month, they got another report, and the crowd was a-growing. And then, lo and behold, the thing that the conference president didn't want to happen did happen. The young preacher called him and said, look, said, I believe God wants you to come down and hold this revival meeting. When can you come? He didn't want to go there. He didn't want to go down there and hold a meeting. It was a waste of his time. He had some uh, lame excuse. He couldn't make it right then, but a few weeks later he got a call again, and that young pastor that supposedly didn't know what he was doing said, come on down. said, we need you. said, I believe God wants you to come hold us a meeting. And the conference president just couldn't think of a good reason why he couldn't. And so reluctantly, he had no choice but to accept. He said, well, all right, I'll come down. But he dreaded it. He waited for the day to come, and he dreaded it. He didn't want to go. But finally, the day came, and he drove down that evening. Had to circle the block two or three times, find a place to park. He thought, what's going on here? But he went inside. Little places packed out, folks he had never seen before. Some of them looked kind of rough. <laughs> Some of them look kind of mean. Some of them kind of scroungy. But I tell you, the Lord had started moving, and a lot of them gotten saved. God helped him, and he recognized very quickly that what he thought couldn't happen. He thought here was a church that couldn't, couldn't make it, and there was a pastor that didn't know anything about pastoring and didn't know how to do it. And he thought, surely it was destined for failure, but now he saw it differently. A cause had captured the heart of a young man, and God had spoken, and in spite of all the reasons why it shouldn't work and couldn't work, the young man hadn't been told or he hadn't listened when they'd told him it couldn't happen. And he was following a cause. He was following his heart, and he marched on. God gave him a powerful congregation, many converts, and I'm be my guess that the church is doing quite well even to this day. There is a cause, ladies and gentlemen. Somehow the thousand people or so who's gathered on this campground could somehow dust off the cause and get a fresh look at it and begin to realize we have a reason, we have a purpose, there is something that we must do and we have the power by God's grace to get it done. We would march on in the face of opposition. We would defy the obstacles because a cause has consumed our hearts. We would not be so easily blown over by every little wind of discouragement. Every little rumor somebody starts about us, we wouldn't throw our hands up and run trembling to our corner. We would march on. The cause will motivate us more than that. We wouldn't have time to stop and get in little feuds one with another. There's a cause that's calling us. We haven't time to waste our time and our energy putting out these little fires that everybody's trying to start about us. There's a cause that consumes our heart, and we must march on. We must accomplish the mission. We cannot be distracted. We will not be distracted. There is a cause. The king said, David, you can't do it. I'm the authority and I'm saying you can't do it. But David said, read my resume again. Hey, Amen. David said unto Saul, let me tell you, let me go through my resume with you. He said, he said, thy servant kept his father's sheep and there came a lion and a bear 
and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him. Amen. <laughs> and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose up against me, now, David, have you mastered the martial arts? No, sir. He said, but I caught him by the beard. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I may not have the martial arts all figured out. I may not, how to do, no, not know how to do it by the textbook, but I caught him with a beard, and I knew that in the power of the Lord that somehow I'd defeat the enemy for there was a cause. I had to spare a lamb, and I refused to let a lion and a bear rise up and consume one of my lambs. Hallelujah. Sometimes we're looking for the, for the Christian workers who have all the spiritual martial arts mastered. But God is looking for somebody who is consumed with the cause. Somebody who recognized there is a lost world and there's souls that's dying and on the way to hell. And our children, our children are weighing in the balances of whether they're going with God or not. And we, and we look for somebody who is the expert and we want in this uh, uh, baby boomer age, we want an expert to do everything for us. We want the expert to sing and the expert to preach and the expert to teach. And God is looking for somebody who will become consumed with a cause. I'm certainly not against uh, being able to do what you do and do it well, but I want to tell you one thing. God sometimes uses the little things to confuse the big. And sometimes he takes the base things to destroy those which are refined. I'm not promoting illiteracy. I'm not promoting ignorance. But I am absolutely promoting having a heart that is on flame, a flame and burning with the cause of Jesus Christ. I'd rather have a pastor that I had to help him read his scripture whose heart was a flame than somebody who could quote Shakespeare to me but whose heart was cold and stiff and formal. Hallelujah. The cause, the cause. But the good news is you may have an education and still be on a burning with the cause. He said, I caught him. I caught him with a beard and I killed him. And I went out after him and smote him and caught him with a beard. And thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them. Seeing he had defied the armies of the living God. He didn't say because I don't like his looks. He didn't say because I don't like the Philistines. He said the cause. Because he hath defied the armies of the living God and he must give an account of himself. Amen. We're not out trying to turn the world upside down because I don't like rock music. I'm not out trying to preach because I don't like long hair on guys or earrings in their ears. I'm not out because I don't like the immorality of our day, though all of those things be true. I'm out because there is a cause that says these people who may be repulsive to us have a soul and Jesus died for them. And somehow I've got to love that soul. I may despise their ways. I may be offended by their lifestyle, but I love their soul and that is the cause. Amen. Is there not a cause? I would to God that somehow we would recognize that we stand on the brink of a grave danger. And that grave danger is this, that we get caught up into celebrating our culture and forget to celebrate our Christ. Hear me. I thank God for a godly subculture in which we live. But let us not be guilty of just celebrating our little subculture more than we celebrate our risen Lord. Hallelujah. There is a cause. There is a cause, and the cause is Jesus Christ. He overcame the evaluation of authority. And finally, after he had gone through his resume with such detail, David said, Moreover, the Lord has delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear. He will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, what else could he say? He said, well, go and the Lord be with you. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
he saw a determination in his eye. He saw that here is a young man who his cause and his conviction will take him farther than, than physical strength. It'll take him farther than training. It'll take him farther than everything else. He saw fire in his eye that he could not put out. And he said, go, and the Lord be with you. And then he had another thought. I think he felt sorry for David. He said, well, David, let me do something for you. And he said, here, here is my armor. He didn't say run down and, and get to, to the to the clothing issue department and get an issue of battle fatigues. No. He said, here is my armor. Take it. I think it was his way of saying, here, I, I care, and I feel kind of guilty about sending you. But here, take my armor. And David looked at it, and David put it all on. And then he found he had one more thing to overcome. He had to overcome the decoration of Saul's armor. I imagine it was quite striking. There are a lot of people who have done quite well in the cause until they got a few stripes on their shoulder. Haven't been worth their salt since then. Never again do they preach a simple gospel message. Amen. Feel like if they can't preach something high and soaring and technical and controversial that they're a little shallow. Tell some lost soul that Jesus loves them and that they can be saved and they can have their sins forgiven. Messages don't get any greater than that. But now he's decorated. He has on Saul's armor and he could have peeked out between and said, it doesn't fit, I'll have to go home. And he could have gone home now. And he could have bragged to his buddies, I saw the battle. I saw the army. I saw the giant. I offered to fight him. I got to see the king and finally talked the king into letting me. And the only thing that kept me from it was he didn't have a uniform to fit me. And all of his buddies would have just marveled at him and he had been a hero. But there was a cause that wouldn't let him go home now. Oh, may the cause somehow burn in our hearts uh, that will keep us uh, from tossing in the towel so quickly. Every time the battle gets hard, Somebody thinks of quitting. And somebody thinks they need a new church every six months just because the battle got hard. No, you need fresh oil. You need help. You need the Spirit of God to touch and anoint you all over again so that you can stand in the battle and be consumed of a cause and fight devils if you have to. And hold on and hold on and not run home every time. Every time the going gets tough or the uniform doesn't fit just right. But he overcame the being decorated. And he began to toss a head helmet this way and a coat of mail another way and some leg shields another direction. What are you doing, David? He said, I can't fight like this. I'm not comfortable. There's some people who are trying to preach the gospel absolutely completely out of your comfort zone. And you wonder why you're not doing anything for the Lord. You're trying to preach somebody else's gospel. You're trying to preach somebody else's standards. You're trying to fit in somewhere where you don't fit. Hear me this morning. I'm calling you, get into your comfort zone. If you're not comfortable being a gravel-throated prophet, maybe God wants a different style for you. Let God lead you. Let God lead you. Let God fa fashion your ministry the way he pleases. Get into your comfort zone so that you can be effective for the Lord Jesus Christ. Trying to be a missionary when you need to be a pastor? Get into your comfort zone. Trying to be a pastor when you're supposed to be a missionary? Get into your comfort zone. Trying to be an evangelist when you're supposed to be a pastor? Get into your comfort zone. Amen. The will of God is your comfort zone. Stay in it. You go home and try to preach Brother Newton's sermons, I don't have to worry about you trying to preach mine. But you go home and try to preach Brother Newton's sermons and try to do it his way and, and all the things you've heard here and everything you've heard everybody else preach and you try to bring it all into one great conglomeration of your ministry and it won't fit you. Get into your comfort zone. There's a cause. We don't have any time to play games. We don't have any time to fool around. 
try to be something we're not. Get in the center of God's will. Get in the place where your ministry is comfortable and do it to the best of your ability in spite of what anybody else has to say about it. You say that's a new twist. Well, I wish you'd take a look at it. We need to get where God can use us. Amen, amen. Don't expect to come hear me preach everything that you hear everybody else preach. It's not my comfort zone. It's not my style. And I have to find where God wants me. And I have to stay there and do me, be the very best that I can in my comfort zone between my soul and God. Hallelujah. And the quicker we learn that, the better off we're going to be and the more effective our ministry is going to be and the more our churches are going to grow. Hallelujah. Amen. That wasn't in my notes, but the Holy Spirit brought it to me, and I wanted to share it with you. And then, then he had some other things to overcome. He had to overcome the intimidation by Goliath. He picks up five rocks, heads out to the battle. He's not overly concerned about any of the about any of the asceticism or if there's an ambiance around here he simply says let's get to the battle and he takes what he's comfortable with and goes to war oh may God help us he marched and then and then Goliath began to intimidate him I read I read when the Philistine looked about and saw David he disdained him for he was but a youth and ruddy and of fair countenance. Plain English saying he didn't even shave yet. That's what it's telling us. And there he was. And a giant looked at him and disdained him. And the giant said, Am I a dog that thou camest to me with staves and the Philistine made the one great mistake of his life. And he cursed David by his gods. That's the core of this cause. That's why David's here anyway. That's what caused his heart to start beating fast in the beginning. Was when he heard him taking the name of his God in vain and defying the God of Israel. And now the, the giant does it again and he curses him in the name of his gods. And the cause stands straight up in David's soul. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, there is a cause. Even when you're cursed and ridiculed and opposed, there is a cause. I talked with a young pastor not long ago who was having problems in his church. And he asked me, he said, tell me, he said, should I address these problems in preaching? I said, listen to me real well. I said, you listen real close. I knew he had about three or four steps that led up to his platform, up to his pulpit. I said, you may battle with those problems all week long. You may wake up with them on your mind and you may go to bed with them on your mind. I said, but when you walk up those steps to that pulpit, remember with every step up, you're rising above it and you're going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're not going up there to stir the problems and get everybody all wondering what that insinuation meant and what something else meant. God help us. There is a cause that is above all of that cheap business. Walk up these steps right here to this platform. Every steps we're rising above the pettiness. Every step we're rising above the differences. Every step we're rising above the feuding. We're rising above it because there is a cause and the word of God must be proclaimed in spite of differences that may prevail, in spite of feuds that might be going on. We rise above it for the cause's sake. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know the story. It ends rather unexpectedly. The giant cheated. He said it's going to be one-on-one. -on -one. And he brought another fellow along to bury shield for him. It's already two on one. The devil will lie to you every time. He'll play dirty every chance he gets. Hallelujah. 
but David had a cause that was motivating him. And he had a God that was the God of the cause. And he did what God asked him to do. And the battle was won. The giant was slain. We need to kill some giants in this day. We need to kill some giants. There are some giants that are kidnapping your children and mine. They're kidnapping them. They're taking them away. They're molesting our children with the pleasures of this old world. They're robbing them. There's a giant of worldliness that laughs and walks among us. There's a giant of legalism that walks through and hardens our hearts. There are giants in our crowd that need to be slain and the cause, the cause must rise. Otherwise we'll fade away. We'll whimper into our corners. We'll find refuge in our smallness, in our exclusivity, in trying to be homogenous. We'll find exclusivity. We'll hide somewhere. We'll run away. But there is a cause, ladies and gentlemen. If we're not careful, we'll gather in and close our doors and hide from the world and only want those people to come in with us who are ready for membership. But we're running from the cause. There is a cause. Hear me. There is a cause. We have to make a choice. We have to make a choice. Is our ministry and is our church, is it going to be a museum or is it going to be a hospital? Some have chosen one and some have chosen another. Some of us have chosen museum. And we've got our saints all lined up. And we've got them looking just right. And we invite the guests in. But stay behind the yellow line. Do not touch and keep passing through. There's a box at the entrance you can drop your gift in, but do not touch. Stay behind the ropes. You're in our museum. God in heaven help us. God in heaven help us. We have lost sight of the cause if that is the driving force that we have. And then there are those who have said, no, we're a hospital. Here are our saints cry on their shoulder show them your broken hearts your wounds come to us with your troubles and we'll tell you about Jesus Christ you can soil our clothes with your tears you can shed your blood on our garments come on in to the hospital for broken hearts we want you to come how does the cause motivate you this morning my friend how does the cause motivate you I read in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 20. This is a very interesting chapter to me. It is here, it is here in chapter 20 that you find Jeremiah at the lowest ebb of his entire life. The great prophet of God. And he tried to preach what God told him to preach. And God said to him, I want you to preach violence and spoil. He said, all right, Lord. And he preached violence and spoil. But the governor, whose name was Pasher, didn't like it. He wanted to hear a message that was going to brag on him. He wanted to hear a little prophecy that was going to say he had a bright future. Instead, he heard violence and spoil. And so he said, bring that prophet in. And they brought Jeremiah in and they gave him a beating. And they put his hands and his feet in the stocks. The stocks that was right beside the house of the Lord and left him there for 24 hours. And everybody went by and did what they were supposed to do. They hissed at him, and they wagged their fingers at him, humiliated him, and there sat the man of God. The shadow from the house of God fell across him in evening time to further humiliate him. And there he sat. And about 24 hours later, Pasher thought, well, I guess he's learned his lesson. And he took him out. But as soon as he took him out, Jeremiah turned to him and preached another little message. He said, Thy name shall no longer be Pasher, but Magor Misabib, for thou shalt be a terror unto thyself and a terror unto thy friends. And he preached him quite a sermon. And then Magor Misabib was gone. Everybody was gone. And there was Jeremiah. And Jeremiah began to talk to the Lord. 
And he said, oh, Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art mightier than I, and thou hast prevailed. I'm in derision all day long. You told me to preach violence and spoil, and that's what I preached, and look what I got. I got a beating. My back is bleeding. My wrist and my ankles are sore. I've been in the stocks all because I did what the Lord wanted me to do. And Jeremiah sunk to a new low. And he said, Lord, if that's the way it is, I will speak no more in your name. I quit. I'm giving up. It's all over. The battle is too hard. I wasn't appreciated. If it goes that way, count me out. But then, just like some of you, just like some of you, oh, if I'd have known what pastoring was, I'm not sure that I would have gotten into it. Come on now. What about the cause? What about the cause? You're not a China doll. You're a soldier in the army of the Lord. What about the cause? Amen and amen. And he said, I'll speak no more in his name. And some of you have thought about quitting, becoming a contractor, a car salesman, or going into insurance or some other noble trade. Thought about quitting. Look down the road at your retirement. There wasn't anything there because you've been in the ministry all your life. And the devil said, kind of got a raw deal, didn't you? And all those people who liked you so well back when your heyday came down when your health was gone, they all said he sure was a nice fellow, wasn't he? And that's about the end of it. And the devil said, didn't amount to much, did it? And somebody said, I'll speak no more in his name. I quit. I'm giving up. But wait a minute. Jeremiah had no sooner said that than he said, wait a minute, Lord. He said, no, Lord, I take it back. He said, for your word... Your word is burning. It's burning like a furnace, like a fire in my bones. And I cannot be quiet. I will preach. I will declare the word of the Lord. I will not quit. I'm not tossing in the towel. There is a cause. And the word of God is burning, burning, burning in my soul. And in spite of all the devils in hell, in spite of every demon, I'm going to stay true to the cause. I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to sing, I'm going to teach, I'm going to pray. Whatever God asks me to do, I'm going to do it not for riches, not for fame, not because Grandma wanted me to, but because there is a cause. And the cause has consumed my heart. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Ladies and gentlemen, if there is no cause, hear me now. If there is no cause, then we should curse our fathers for having led us this way. We should lock up our buildings and run for our lives. But if there is a cause, and, a, and there is, then let us rise up and call our fathers blessed. And let us build more buildings and more churches and open new mission fields. And don't let a one of us run. Everyone stay with the goods. Everyone stand there. Everyone take your position. Holding arms. And let's march on until the enemies of God are defeated and the cause of God gloriously advanced and soul saved. Ladies and gentlemen, are you consumed with the cause? Is there not a cause? Hallelujah. Stand with me, please.